Hello and uh, welcome to Town Talk. I'm your host, Rose Highland Sharp. This very inspirational program is brought to you by Highland Communications for storytelling, entertainment, music, and much more. Call at 910-528-0718. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. Stay tuned for the Moore County NAACP, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 2019 celebration in Southern Pines, North Carolina, held at the H.A. Wilson Auditorium on the campus of Southern Pines Primary School. And of course, the featured speaker, Judge Regina Joe. Some young speakers from the local schools, from West End Elementary School, Southern Middle School, and Pinecrest High School, and step team, of course, from Southern Middle School. And you'll see some of the young adult committee leaders, the chairpersons, and associate chairpersons with the Moore County NAACP, and the president of the Moore County NAACP, Olinda D. Watkins, some of the laypersons, ministers, pastors. And uh, this is a segment, uh, part one, and you'll see part two with other speakers, music, and the march on that part. So enjoy Town Talk. Well, before that, sorry, Lanisha Womack, wherever Miss Lanisha Womack is. Another book for thought came in. I want to make sure I'm all these out. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King's last public speech that he gave predicted his death. Mm. But he kept fighting. Mm. Good afternoon. My name is Lanisha Womack Bailey, and I am an NAACP Next Gen Leader. I am so excited to be here today and to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Judge Regina Jones. Judge Regina Joe was appointed as the Chief Public Defender for Hope in Scotland County, making history as the first African-American female Chief Public Defender in the state. She made history again as the first African-American and first female judge to hold the position as District Court Judge of Judicial District 16A in Hope in Scotland County in November 2006 election. With her recent win at the poll, Judge, judge Regina Jones obtained a seat as the District Court Judge for District 19. Mm -hmm. Judge Joe has specialized juvenile, has specialized in juvenile certification and has served on the Board of Governors for the North Carolina Association of District Court Judges from 2009 to 2013. She served as president of the North Carolina Association of District Court Judges in 2013 by election by her fellow district court judges across the state. Currently serving on the District Court Judges Education Committee. We are grateful for her presence among, among us today. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Judge Regina Jones. Great man. 
one of the things that impressed me was they had young folks that were in competition and that were addressing the masses in reference to democracy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., what that meant, and we're talking about 10, 11, and 12 year olds that were addressing groups of people. And a couple of things that they said, you know, resonated with me, and I said, you know, that's the reason for uh, why we're here today and what this is about. One of the young folks was talking about how we adults, if we don't get it right, if those of us that are in party politics and we're bickering and carrying on now the way that we are, if they can't get it right, this 10-year-old out of the mouth of babe said, it's up to us. Another one came up, she must have been about 11 or 12, and said, we need to get out of Facebook and put our face in a book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How often is that? But we've got these young minds that are looking ahead and seeing the boulders, the, the stumbling blocks that are in our way, and maybe we're too close to the forest, can't see the forest for the trees, to see what's going on. The message that I'd like to leave with you today is for us adults, because it's our responsibility to point our seats in the right direction. But the message also is for our youth and for our young people, because as someone said earlier, you all are our tomorrow. Collectively, we all have to do this. This labor of justice and equality is perpetual. And what that means is we have to fight at it over and over and over again. We will die, but the dream will not. But before we can do anything collectively, we have to build strength individually. And that's where my message comes from. I've spoken in several different forums, but I would have to say that one of the most important that I've spoken was was when I was in my office as an assistant public defender. As a district court judge now, I have a judicial standard looking over, and there are things that, a lot of things that we cannot do and cannot say. My communication and interaction with the public is a lot more limited now than when I was a prosecutor or when I was a public defender. As an assistant public defender and eventually chief public defender, I got so much pleasure in meeting so many different people. And I, you know, I met them under the worst of circumstances because basically the only time I really got to interact with somebody is when they were charged with something or they were in trouble or there was a crisis, a legal crisis in their lives. I got to sit down and explain to them the judicial system. I was the first exposure. And it gave me such joy to do that, not because it was a good thing that they were there, but because I could be somebody's eyes and ears. And I'm telling you, I know those of us who are a little more seasoned know this, but for the young folks, knowledge is power. Yes. Yes. You unlock the power of the pen, and you can do a lot. You can speak so many different languages. A lot of times when we have difficulties, and further, we want to resort to fighting, we want to resort to ugliness, we want to take it to the street. But I'm here to tell you, there is a universal language. And once you unlock the power of the pen, you can fight on any ground you want. community, as a state, as a nation, to go through a phase of negative or even destructive behavior. And I think that's where we are now. That's one thing. It's another when we perpetuate that behavior or we get stuck in this perpetual cycle and we can't break those chains until the chain breaks us. And before we get to that point, you want to try to pull up and try to turn this thing around. For those of us who know about strife and hardships and tribulations, no matter who you are, you're going to go through them. 
Because if it were easy, everybody would be in line for it. <laughs> You're going to go through it. And, but the difference between those of us who make it on the other side and those of us who don't, you've got winners and you've got losers. We all are going to fail at something at some point in our lives. And we must. Because that's how we grow. If you win the game every time, you're not, you need somebody to come and spank you so that you will know next time what you did wrong and you can be better at it. Those of us who go through that, you get up, you're going to have bumps and bruises, there'll be boulders in the road, and sometimes what appears to be insurmountable odds. You think you can't make it on the other side, but when you do, you're a better person for it when you come out of it. If God didn't allow these obstacles to be in our way, I promise you we would not grow. And Lord knows I've had some obstacles in our way. All of us have our story. Everybody's got their story. I liken it to a patchwork quilt. Um, for those of you who don't know, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and all would have all these different colored pieces of cloth that they would intricately sew together and make this beautiful patchwork quilt. Every one of us in our lives is like a patchwork quilt. And each of those different colored pieces of cloth represents something. It's some kind of hardship in your life that you may be able to relate to that somebody else can. It may be peer pressure. It may be drugs. It may be pregnancy. It may be your job. It may be your spouse. It may be truancy. Every what it is, we all have our challenges. The question is not whether or not we fall down because everybody's going to fall down. But you know what you got to do. You got to get up. And that's what makes the difference. And I think it's the fact that each of us is here trying to learn something on this special Memorial Day is a testament that we have what it takes to make it through. I want to share a little bit with you about, uh, about my son, Isaiah. He is my only child. And I'm going to share with you, all of us have a hand that we are dealt. And this is the hand that he was dealt. His mom came from a two-parent household with four siblings. My mom and dad had five girls. All girls. <laughs> so, I, you know, five girls and a wife. I'm not sure how much bathroom time my dad got. But sometimes we didn't have what we wanted. <coughs> But we always had what we needed. Right. My mom got to the 11th grade and never went back to school. And I'm here to take my mom and my dad are my heroes and my sheroes. My dad did not get me on the fifth grade. If I get a little emotional, pardon me. He's with Jesus and been with him for years. He's fine. But he was my hero. He didn't get past the fifth grade. And I remember when my daddy came up to see me at Campbell University School of Law. He put his baby through law school, and he would come up there to see me, and it was my honor. Mm. It was the honor of my classmates for me to introduce my dad, who didn't get me on the fifth grade, to them. I feel like everyone should feel like they have the best mom and the best dad in the world. My mom and dad did for us what they couldn't do for themselves. All five girls had the very same opportunity with limited funds and limited names. How many of you ever heard of lands? Crackers? Potato chips? I said, look, lots of hands need to go up. My mama raised us on lands. She worked at lands for years and years. Third shift at that. I said, you're a good one. Because I do that. My dad. At Christmas time, they would get one pair of shoes. Young folks, I want you to listen for a moment. Yes. At Christmas time, they would get, and my daddy lived in the country. Anybody ever heard of wax off? Yes. Wax off, Lord. Yes. Yes. I've always lived in Charlotte, but daddy told me all about wax off. They would get one pair of shoes for Christmas, and it had to last them the entire year. It wasn't any of these Air, Air Jordans, or uh, they didn't have cell phones. And, uh, air bugs, air bugs, air bugs, and, and beads. 
There was none of that. He had one pair of shoes, and that had to do him for the entire year. My dad had a janitorial service. He worked two jobs. He worked at a nuclear turbine plant in Charlotte called Westinghouse. And then on the side, he had a cleaning business. And do you know who his cleaning crew were? Exactly. He five girls. That's right. We did not get to stay after school and participate in extracurricular activities because we knew once school was out, or even on the weekends, it was not unusual for us to be heading out at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm not talking about getting up at 5. You had to get up before 5 because we were heading out at 5 o'clock. And you, you better be in that Jeep with the trailer behind it with all the cleaning supplies and daddy's going to jack you up. <laughs> My father taught us everything as far as character and honesty and all of that. We were his cleaning crew. We would go, we would leave out at 5 o'clock in the morning on the weekends and be back by 12 or 1 o'clock so that we could have the rest of the afternoon and the weekend to ourselves. I can mop, I can strip floors, I can clean a toilet, sparkling clean, dust, vacuum with the best of them. Because that's how my dad raised us. Good, hard, honest work and then put his baby through law school. Mm. Yeah. 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 And did sweet potatoes and probably much else I don't know. I've never done any of those things. He did them just as any good parent would want better for their child so that we could go to the school that we wanted and I would wear my little Tar Heel shirt, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. That say. was where I went to undergraduate. That's because right. my dad worked, and my mom worked so hard mm -hmm. so that we could have the things that they didn't have. We would get up early and get ready to go clean buildings. Daddy would have to deal with attitude, mm -hmm. lips poked out, mm -hmm. sleepy in the morning, grumbling and talking underneath the breath is something I call Team Two. Um, little did I know, with all of this stuff, there was a lesson that was being taught to me. God gave us two pens, one to sit on and one to think with. I guarantee you that your successes and failures in life are directly related to whichever one you use the most. So, I'm grumbling and carrying on, and over the years and over the years, it wasn't until I became a full-grown woman, and years down the road, and become established in what I do, that I realized this was all in God's divine plan. Mm -hmm. And all of this that was happening was a lesson that I had to go through in order to learn what I was taught. Little did I know that God was helping me practice one hand over the other, over and over again. And little did I know that it would eventually leave me standing before you and doing what I'm doing today. Isaiah's father is a retired trooper with the North Carolina State Highway Patrol, the big brother trooper that most folks in Hope and Scotland counties have become acquainted with or have heard of. And I don't mean that by way of ticket or anything, but it's just that we're small counties and everybody knows. Oh, that's, that's your, Trooper Joe, that's your husband. And then they start talking to me and everything like I can help them with a ticket or something. I, <laughs> um, I always addressed my husband as Joe, and he was a military thing. He was in the armed services. So, I mean, my name's Regina Joe. His name is Stevie Joe. We be in the house, and I say, Joe, yo. <laughs> so, when I say Joe, I'm referring to Isaiah's dad. Joe's mother was very young and was uh, unable to care for him. Therefore, his grandparents raised him. We know something about that. Yes. Growing up in the big city of Wilmington, sometimes they didn't even have heat in their home. It was not unusual during the winter months that Mama Marie, his grandmother, would run a big tub of water uh, in the tub and they would use that for cooking and for cleaning and for bathing or whatever else they needed before those pipes froze up that night. Joe was made fun of, picked on, and got to fight a lot as a child. Of course, he 
didn't have that problem as an adult. But as a young child, he had a dream, and it was to become a highway patrol. So out of all this history comes Isaiah, our 15-year-old son. He's beginning to put the pieces of the, the uh, claws together for his patchwork quilt. He's building his story, sewing everything together. And that plays a pivotal part in where you're going to be in our tomorrow. It is our responsibility as adults to lead and guide our young folks. It is your responsibility, as someone said, to pick up that torch and keep moving in a direction forward and not backward. What I would do from day one, when I first took office, I've been a judge, I'm going into my 13th year. I think it was two when I was first elected. On any given day, I'd get up, I'd go on up to the courthouse and I would do my thing. Once the summer months came, or the spring, and the days were longer, it was not unusual to see Judge Joe around 5.30 or 6 o'clock outside, uh, Isaiah pulling him in a wagon, or having some sidewalk chalk, or something there in the house. Everybody go buy somebody to blow out, throw my hand up, and we start drawing chalk again. This is me making a deposit and an investment in my seat for tomorrow, your seat for tomorrow. And that's what we have to do on a continuous basis. He was two years old then. He's 15 now, and I'm still sowing that seed. Part of sowing that seed, these days it's a different culture. It's a different generation. Everything, I, it blew my mind when I first picked him up. He's in his first year of high school. And he comes out, and as he's walking to the car, I'm looking around, and everybody is earbuddled up. Everybody's walking around with their electronics. That's right. Everybody's engaged. One of the first things I did was made a rule. We may not always eat together, but when you're at the kitchen table, no electronics. Exactly. And one other thing, the day that I don't get the password to the phone, you fill in the blank.
Some days you will tame the tiger, and some days the tiger's going to have you for lust. you got to remember that sometimes God calms the storm, and sometimes he lets the storm rage, and he calms his child. He didn't promise us a calm passage. He promised us a safe land. So we have to remember that, and we have to go through the deep end of the water in order to grow. That means we have to roll up our sleeves, dig down deep to make things happen. You gotta have drive and determination and resolve to keep moving forward. But you must have a plan and you must have a goal. And problems ain't nothing but opportunity and work close. So remember that. The tragedy in life is not failing to reach your goal. The tragedy is not having a goal from the video. The tragedy is not having a goal to even begin with. Aim at nothing, and you'll succeed every time. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. uh -huh. I was born and raised in Charlotte. I got my education. I got my job. I would get up in the morning. I would put on my little suit. I would get in my little car. I would drive on up to my little office and take the elevator and punch the button to the third floor and go on up to the courtroom and do my thing. I, I got my little slice of pie. I did that. I did what I wanted to do in life. But remember this, as you find many changes developing in your life, take a switch and walk away with this. It's not where you're from. It's where you're going. It's not what's on you, it's what's in you. It's not what you drive, it's what drives you. It's not what you think, it's what you do. Because actions speak louder than words. Alright, I'm about to take my seat. But I'm going to leave you with this. I am a district court judge, so I had to put a little something in there in reference to what I do. So, this last thing I'm going to tell you about is a little story, and the moral of that story is, you can't fool Jesus. <laughs> We're going to start off with the burglar. The burglar broke into the house. It was dark, 2 o'clock in the morning, very, very quiet. He breaks in, he's going to get him a score. He's looking for electronic equipment, stuff he can take fast. iPads, iPhones, electronic stuff. He gets a couple of things and he puts them over to the door. He has his flashlight on because he's not familiar with the surroundings. Well, as he's scoping everything and he's got his little stash of stuff up, up in the corner, he hears somebody say, Jesus is going to get you. <laughs> he stopped. He turned his flashlight off. He froze. He just stood there for seconds. After he didn't hear anything, he started smelling himself again and got himself going again and starts going over and then starts unplugging the, uh, the, this equipment. He's going to haul this over to the door. He's halfway across the room. He hears again, Jesus is going to get you. <laughs> he stops again. He shakes his head because now he knows he's not just hearing things. He turns the light off. As he turns it off, the room is completely dark. And then slowly his eyes begin to adjust and he starts seeing things, silhouettes. He looks way over in the corner and he sees something tall from whence he thought the sound had come. He turns his flashlight back on and lo and behold, there's a bird cage. And there's a beautiful little parrot in it. So he's looking and he says, Parrot, did you say that? Parrot said, yep. Yeah. Jesus is going to get you. He said, Parrot, what is your name? Parrot said, my name is Moses. And Jesus is going to get you. He said, what kind of a fool family names a parrot Moses? Bird said, Rah. same fool family that named a pit bull Jesus. Hey.
time right now to ask all our young people to come up here in the front because we want you all to have a photo of our uh, judge, Regina Joe. So we're just going to take a moment. All the young people come up here and line up. Judge Joe is going to ask you to come down. And the photographer is going to give us a So I'm just asking to just take this photo up because this is a rare moment that we have this picture of our judge, Regina Joe. Because 
murder for democracy. We can start deep to the belief that democracy transformed from dictator to sneak action. It is the greatest form of government on earth. But we are here in a specific sense because of the best situation in my family. We are here because we are determined to get the situation corrected. The situation is not at all new. The problem has been existing over endless years. For many years now, Negroes in Montgomery and so many other areas have been inflicted by the paralysis of crippling fears on buses in our community. On so many occasions, Negroes have been intimidated and humiliated and oppressed because of the sheer fact that they were Negroes. I don't have time this evening to go into the history of these numerous cases. Many of them now are lost in the thick fog of oblivion. But at least one stands before us now with glaring dimensions. Just last week, last Thursday to be exact, one of the finest citizens in my country. Not one of the finest Negro citizens, but one of the finest citizens in my country. Was taken from a bus, carried to jail, and arrested because she refused to get up to give mercy to a white person. Now, the press will have us believe that she refused to leave a reserve section for Negroes. But I want you to know this evening that there is no reserve section. The law has never been clarified at that point. Now, I think I can speak with legal authority standing behind me that the law, the city ordinance has never been totally clarified. Ms. Rosa Parks is a fine person. And I'm happy that it happened to a person like this part. For nobody can doubt the balance I was occurring to pay me. Nobody can doubt the height of her character. And I'm happy that it happened to a person that no one can call a disturbing factor in the community. Miss Park is a fine Christian person, unassuming in debt. There is integrity and character there, but because she refused to get up, she was arrested. My friends, there comes a time when people are tired of getting trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time when people are tired of being plunged across the abyss of humiliation. There comes a time where people are tired of getting pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing in the piercing chill of November, there comes a time. We're here this evening because we're tired now. I want to say that we are not here advocating violence. We have never done that. And I want it to be known throughout Montgomery in this nation that we are Christian people. The only weapon we have here this evening is the weapon of protesting, certainly. Certainly, this is the glory of America in all of its faults. This is the glory of our democracy. If we were trapped behind the iron curtains of a communist nation, we couldn't do this. But the great glory of an American democracy is the right to protest for rights. Friends, there will be no crosses burned at any bus stops in my home. There will be no white persons taken from their homes, carried to a road, and lit for not cooperating. I want it to be known that we're going to work with bold determination to get justice on buses in our community. And we're not wrong for what we do. 
to fight until justice runs like water and righteousness up a mighty stream. Before me, I want to say this. I want to urge you. You have voted for this boycott and have done so with great enthusiasm. So now, let us go out and stick together and work until this thing ends. Now, doesn't that mean sacrificing? Yes. It means sacrificing at times. But we've got to learn that there are things out there that we need to sacrifice for. And we have got to come to the point where we are determined not to accept the things that we have been accepted in the past. So I urge you to join this protest today. We have the facilities you need to get to your jobs and cabs at your service. Automobiles will be at your service. And don't be afraid to look in the car. And if you have it, if you are fortunate enough to have a little bit of money, save it. Use it for a good cause. Now, my automobile will be in it. It has been in it. And I'm not concerned about what you guys are going to do. Thank you.
and the most effective way. But Martha is not the only way. And, and all of us here are leaders. We can show that we are Thank you. Yay! Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Right. 
of engineers, <coughs> scientists, yes. and entrepreneurs. Because right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is about empowering the most important race on this planet, the human race. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. Let's give all that participation for the and we come in and we be a part of a good part of the information to us and we need to take it to heart. Nobody stood for it, but he gave some good information that we need for right now. So we thank him for that. Uh, in my, and, and we can get ready to do the benediction. I had the fortune of meeting Coretta Scott King uh, in the year of about 2004. And uh, she was so courageous and so gracious and so beautiful. And uh, so I thought of have a little conversation with her, but it was getting late in the evening and she looked at me and she said, you young folk can stay up pretty late. She said, I got to go to bed. <laughs> but I told her that I did my research on Dr. Martin Luther King was in high, high school and I thought I knew everything about him that could be known. And she showed me a little pamphlet or a, 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 a folder that she had she said, we didn't give all our speeches away. We still got a lot so that when she go around to make her speeches, she could glean all the tears. But she did leave me with this good tidbit of information. She looked at me, she said, Martin said that everybody ought to be a light, a headlight. And not a tail line.
God, we pray that you will come and strengthen us on every hand. God, we pray that you will prop us up on every leading side. God, we pray that you will be a God that will hold us in the hollow of your hands in a time like this. We thank you again, God, for life. We thank you for health and we thank you for strength. Even for those, God, that participated in the march, God, we just want to give you the praise, oh God, for allowing them the opportunity and the strength, God, because so many, God, could not do it, but we thank you because you gave us life, health, and strength. Even a sound mind, we give you a name and praise. Now, God, we pray that you will go with us and stand by us, uphold us in all good. We thank you and give you a name and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Certainly hope you enjoyed the program today. I'm Rose Highland Sharp. Honey, if you're walking a walk, you'll be on Town Talk. Town Talk airs daily at 11 a.m. on WYBE-TV, Spectrum Cable 3, Southern Pines, North Carolina, and on Rose Highland Sharp YouTube. It is a service to the community.